Well, welcome to Water of Life. This is our online campus and I'm your campus pastor today. My name is John and I am so excited for you to be here with us today. I know God has something incredible for the service. I know we've been praying and planning and getting ready with worship and the message and everything else. And we're just really excited that you've come and that you've kind of set this time aside to, to press into God, to hear from Him. And I know that He's gonna show up. And if this is your first time with us, let us know. We would love to just be able to greet you. If you could text the word new here as one word to the number 818-818, it would just allow us to say hi to you, say welcome, give you a little information so that you can navigate your time with us at Water of Life. And if you'd like to give uh, tithes and offerings as part of your worship today, I wanna to encourage you, thank you so much for that. Your faithful giving over the past few months has really allowed us to continue really important ministry in our community and in our world. And so if you'd like to give today, you can do so by going onto the Water of Life app or you can give online at wallupdates.com. That's W-O-L updates.com. And so a few things I wanna put in front of you before we get into today's service. And the first is, uh, I know during this holiday season, we look forward to family traditions, we look forward to Thanksgiving. One of my favorite, favorite family traditions is giving at CityLink over Thanksgiving. This year, we're gonna be giving about 2,000 food baskets to our community, and that's a huge number. And so we need the whole church to come together and really contribute. And those bins are available here at the Fontana campus and also at the Upland campus. And you can get lists for what to buy for those food baskets at wallupdates.com. In addition, you can actually go and be a part of the packing at our Pack and Praise on November 15th, and you can also be a part of food distribution to the community on November 19th. Also, another really amazing thing that we've been doing that's been a tradition over just the past couple of years is a thing called Dollar Club. Now, if you've remembered what we've done in the past, we've Everybody comes together and they just pull out, if they've got a single dollar, they put that in the offering, or you can even give through the Water of Life app or um, through the website. You just give a single dollar and we put it all together and it ends up going to a project overseas and really helping out. Because you can imagine a church our size, when they're all giving money, it, it's, it enables us to do something really significant overseas. And so this time, we're gonna be building a well, digging a well in Kenya for our partners over there. And this is gonna be huge for that community there to have clean water for the first time because of this well that we're able to dig for them. And for us, it's, it's like a dollar, you know? Like you can't even buy anything with a dollar. But to be able to do something so significant with something that seems so little is just amazing. And so you'll wanna do that this weekend. I know I'll be doing it, I don't carry cash, but I'll be using the app to give a dollar to the Dollar Club. Also, we have the night of prayer and worship coming up. It's gonna be the end to our 40 days of prayer. We did one a few weeks ago, and on November 13th, Friday, from 7 to 10 p.m. at the Fontana campus, we're gonna do the second evening of prayer and worship to close out the whole 40 days. And so this will be streamed live for people who aren't able to be there in person, and there'll actually be a kids program, like a kids night of prayer and worship for your elementary age kids. And so if you want more information about that, you can go to wallupdates.com. Uh, if you wanna find out what's going on with the kids, if you wanna find out what, uh, what you're doing or how to stream it, um, but I wanna encourage you, we only have a few days left with the 40 days of prayer, and so press in, uh, be a part of it, and you can always go to wall40days.com to get more information about that. Also, one of the things that uh, we do as a family for, at Christmas is we always go to the Agua de Vida Orphanage at Christmas time. This year we can't go, so we're doing a blood drive that's gonna support our partners over there. For every donation, $20 is gonna go directly to the orphanage. And so it'll, that blood drive is this weekend, November 8th on Sunday, and you can show up to the campus or you can make an appointment at wallupdates.com to give blood. Uh, during this time, this next 75 minutes or so, I wanna encourage you to just set aside distractions and just really prepare your hearts for worship. So let's do that right now. God, would you just work in us and in us and through us, Lord, Holy Spirit, just come to the homes and the places where everyone's watching today. I pray that you'd be with them and that, Father, in worship, we would be able to press into you and really experience your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's enjoy worship together. Campus if 
you're tuning in from home, welcome. Right here in the room, if you love Jesus, can you lift your hands to heaven? God, our heart is yours. We lift it to you. Be magnified today. Faithful in the sanctuary, faithful in the storm. Worthy in the empty spaces, worthy in my soul. Now, yeah. 
you high God your name be lifted you said if your name be lifted you would draw all men unto you draw us closer God we can never be close enough God we want to be closer give us the desire God to, to run after you with everything we have in us thank you for your presence that ignites something in us that brings us alive that waters our weary soul thank you for life itself the breath we breathe is borrowed from you and we return it back to you today. And we thank you for it. We love you. Thank you for this time. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. If you love Jesus, come on online. In Townsville, right here in this room, we shout to heaven. We're so glad you're with us today, wherever you're watching from. Before you're seated here in the room, why don't you wave to someone before you take your seats and welcome them to Water of Life. God bless.
Hey, how are you today? Wow, worship was good, wasn't it good? Five of you said yes, the rest of you said I don't know. No. Winter came, didn't it? Yay for winter. Let's pray. Father, we want to come to you right now and just say that you are a glorious God, amazing God, surprising God. You just uh, always, always care for us in ways we can't imagine. And so as we come into your presence today, we pray that you would pour out, Holy Spirit, pour out the Father's heart on us, that we would know you better, love you more, Father, be built up by you, encouraged by you. You're a God who blesses people who chase after him. So thank you for that, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Okay, so if you're a veteran, I want you to stand right now. I want to pray for you. This is Veterans Week. It's not Veterans Day, but it's Veterans Week. So we want to pray for you. If you're online, we want to welcome you and say, stand up in your living room. We'll pray for you. Yeah. Upland, stand up if you're over at Upland campus. We want to pray for you too. Let's pray together. Father, we want to pray right now. And just bless men and women that have served in armed forces, that have served to protect our right to worship you, God. We want to bless them wherever they're at here in this room in Upland, uh, around the world, online, wherever they are, Father. We want to bless them right now and say thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for people who have sacrificed for our well-being and our protection. We bless them in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen, 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 amen. amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A couple other things really quick. Uh, we still need some people in EK, so we had a bunch of you sign up, and so if you would like to help us in Empowered Kids uh, with Water of Life Kids, we'd love to have you come in and help us. You can text 909-341-1600. 909-341-1600, or you can go online at uh, empoweredkids.org, and you can sign up there. You could call the church office, but we need like 30, 25 more people, so we're trying to run services for our children at 9.30 and 11.30 on Sundays, and so we need your help. If you would love to, like to help us, just try it out. Just go in and walk in and check it out, and you can do anything like that. It's not a life sentence. Some of you are like, oh. I'll never get out if I get in. No, we'll let you out. You know, we'll let you out. You might not want out. You might be so blessed you don't, you don't want out. But the reality is we've got that going. Last thing is, last week I announced to you um, a dollar club. So we're going to do dollar club for two weeks. If you don't know what the dollar club is, typically it used to be we would fill up this place and we'd ask people to give a dollar. And wherever that dollar went, it went to bless somebody. This uh, dollar club is going to go to Kenya and it's gonna to go to bless a village in Kenya with a water well that we are gonna dig there. And so we're gonna dig a water well in Kenya. There are several hundred kids in the village that have unclean water to drink all the time. So wanna, I met a pastor um, named Dominic and his wife Sharon last February when I was in Joy Springs, Cabrera Slums, our school in uh, Kenya. And Dominic was going up to this village and I've been texting back and forth, emailing with him all the time. And he said, Pastor, could you help us? There's no clean water here. Could you imagine that? No clean water. And I said, we can help you. So that's our dollar club. It was last week and this week. If you want to put a dollar in, that would be a blessing. So we're going to drill a well in a village in Kenya and make a difference. So you got your Bible, your iPad, your phone. Uh, you can open up. I think you got actually half page inserts today. Did you not? That's an amazing thing. So you can grab those and pull them out. If you're online, I want to welcome all of you online and say uh, thank you for joining us. If you've got your um, 40 Days of Prayer guide, we're going to be in there. You've got your half-page insert is also in your 40 Days of Prayer prayer guide. So we're in the fifth message on 40 Days of Prayer. So we've been doing the last five weeks just talking about prayer, 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 and prayer, right? We've talked about changing our habits, making new habits, Talked about prayer is a relationship with God. It's a, like a conversation. It's not a ceremony. We've talked about, you know, what happens when God says what? No. no. We talked about that last week when God says no. And sometimes he does, he does say no to us. And how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with that? And next week, we're going to close up this 40 days of prayer with a night of worship. So I want to invite you to come on Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. That's a good day to worship, huh? 
We're going to join in here for a night of worship and prayer. We'd love to have you come and close up our 40 days of prayer. It's been an amazing, amazing time. But today, we're going to talk, the last message we're going to talk about is really the most impacting message, I think, of everything you could say about prayer, because prayer is about relationship. And it has to do with the person of God. And what we're going to talk about today actually influences every other part of your life and your view of God. What we're going to talk about is God's goodness. You know, there's some messages you can preach that are hard messages, like last week when we talked about saying no, that's hard message. This week, this is easy message, because God is good all the time, and all the time what? God is good. Now, we don't always feel that, do we? We always, sometimes we're like, no, that doesn't feel good. But the truth is, God is good. And how you see him and his character will influence everything about your relationship with God, and especially how you pray or don't pray, how you worship, how you love God, how you draw near to him, all those things. If you see God as upset, mad, a rule keeper, demanding, all those kinds of things, you're, you're gonna have problems praying. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're gonna have trouble praying. You're, you're gonna be like, I, I don't wanna go there. But let me tell you what A.W. Tozer said. He wrote this a long time ago. This is an amazing quote. He said, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you because it affects everything else in your life. Let me say that again. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you because it affects everything else in your life. So think like this. If you don't love God, if you hate God, does that impact every other area of your life? If you have no, if you're kind of indifferent about God and you think he's way out there, does that impact your life? The decisions you make, the values you hold, all of these things, friends, are impacted by what comes to your mind when you think about God. So is God good or not? See, the, the, the truth is, the Bible says that it's the kindness of God that led us to repentance. We didn't get to God on our own. Uh, Romans chapter two says that, that we got to God because he was so what? Kind, he was so kind to us. What an amazing thought, that God is kind to people. And a lot of people don't believe that about God. They think that God is not kind, that he's not a good God. You know, when Jesus came to the earth, one of the very first things that he did is try to straighten out wrong thinking about the Father. And that's the whole Sermon on the Mount, we call it, or the Beatitudes, like the, uh, the, the upside down things of Jesus, like, you know, it, it, the blessed be the poor, blessed are these people, and you're like, what, 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 what? That was all about reversing bad thinking about God. That's all Jesus was doing, was trying to help people change bad thinking. And friends, if you don't understand the goodness of God and how good he really is, then you're not gonna wanna draw near to him because it is his goodness that draws you into his presence. So, so, so we're gonna land there today. We're just gonna walk around this. A lot of verses. Uh, let's start with Psalm 31. David made a statement. He said, God, your goodness is so great, you have stored up great blessings for those who honor you. Your goodness is so great. Now, how many of you know David was a guy who was after God's what? Why was David after God's heart? Because it was good. Hello? Do you think David would have chased after God's heart if it was bad? <clears throat> David started to really touch the heart of God, press into the heart of the Father, and he was so taken by the heart of God that he chased, he spent the rest of his life chasing after God. And that's exactly what happens to people who figure this out, friends. When you figure out that God's goodness is so great that he stored up blessings, hold, 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 hold it. He stored up blessing for who? <clears throat> for you. He stored, I mean, come on, that means that your name is on it. He stored it up for you. He couldn't give it to anybody what? He stored it up for you, he couldn't give it to anybody else. He says he stores up blessings for those who honor him. So when you honor God, there's blessing actually being stored up for you. He's intentional about blessing you and loving you. Now, I try to say this to you every single week. We walk around this over and over and over. Why? Because so many people don't believe it. So many of you, I, I, even today, even after this weekend, I will get an email, I promise you, from somebody or a few people here that will say, okay, I finally figured it out. God is really good. 
And you're like, I've been here for eight years listening to you say this. No, 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 you gotta get this. This is a linchpin for your whole journey with God. And I understand, because I walked for 17 years trying to understand how could the God of the Old Testament and the guy named Jesus be the same person? Anybody thought that? Uh, I mean, I read the Old Testament and I'm like, God killed the Amorites, God killed these people. And then Jesus comes, Jesus doesn't kill anybody. No, really, come on, I mean, be honest about it. I read that and I was like, what's wrong with this picture? It doesn't work for me, I don't understand. I don't understand how this God in the Old Testament is the same as this God in the New Testament. I don't get that. I can't figure it out until I ran into a verse and I've quoted it to you for so long but it changed my life. It was God talking about God, not somebody else talking about God, not somebody else describing God. It was God on God, Exodus 34, six and seven. It's in your little uh, keychain of memorization verses. It changed my life. The verse changed my life. It says, the Lord, the Lord God is compassionate and gracious. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. That means if God is compassionate and gracious, there's gotta be a reason for all the other things that I didn't understand in the Old Testament. And I figured out later there was, but I had to do more homework, I had to dig under the surface, I had to understand things that the God of the Old Testament is outward and judgment is immediate, the God of the New Testament is inward and deals with us inside, not just outside, but inside. And that's why he said he would give you a new heart a new life, and the work that God would do would be secret inside of you. But, 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 but judgment is still there. I mean, you can read the book of Revelation. Is that right or not? There's still judgment because there's no justice without judgment. And so there's got to be judgment. But it's all different. It's all, God has pushed judgment back in the New Testament and said, I will judge you. That's Romans chapter two talks about all over there about that. I will judge you, that's my role, but, but, but I'm in love with you. Please come to me, come to me, come to me, I'm crazy about you. So when I read this verse, Exodus 34, six and seven, the Lord, the Lord God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, hold, hold, hold it. I thought God was mad, man. I thought God was sitting up in heaven with this like holy hammer and you got out of line and you just became a grease spot in the road. Man, you move sideways or something, God was gonna splatter you in a second. And, and no, he said, he said, no, I'm not mad at you. I'm slow to anger and I'm abounding in something. What is it? Loving kindness, hold, hold, hold it. Try to get your head around that word. That's not a word we use anymore. But loving, we get that. Loving, that God is loving. And then kindness put together. God's love is demonstrated towards people in what? Kindness. He's kind towards us, we don't deserve it. So the Lord, Lord God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, which means God is a truth teller. He is truth, the Bible literally says that. He abounds in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands, that would be us. He holds his love for you, he can't give it to anybody else, you can put your name in there. Keeps loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Those are the three ways that we all mess up, willful sin, weak sin, and transgressions, things that we trespass into places, we go places we shouldn't go. There's a whole study on that, but, 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 but hold it, Pastor Dan, there's the next verse. How many of you read your memory verses this week? There's the next verse, verse seven. But he will not leave what? The guilty unpunished. He will visit iniquity to the third and fourth generation. What? That's like, whoa, you just canceled out everything in the other verse. I thought that you were a good, good God. I thought you were kind to people. I thought, but you will visit, what? He will not leave the guilty unpunished, but that's clear in the New Testament as well. But, but, it, but it says, he will visit iniquity to the third and fourth generation. Now, I, that really stumbled me. I mean, that was hard for me. I was like, where, what does that mean? What are you saying? It doesn't seem like somebody in the third and fourth generation should have to pay for what grandpa, great grandpa, great grandma did. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't feel like that's very just. But then when you start to study the Bible, you can really figure out that's not what is being said at all. What is being said, it says in Deuteronomy, 
that God only visits iniquity to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Hello? People who what? Hate him. So what does that mean? Well, that means if you hate God, God will just withdraw from you. He just pulls back. How many of you know there are people who hate God? There are probably people in your family, in your lineage that have hated God. And when you hate God, something happens. God pulls back. Now here's what we don't understand about the spiritual realm, is how often God holds back darkness. That God is always, always, always holding back hell. Because see friends, God is crazy about people, but there's somebody else who hates you. Who's that? It is Satan, it's very real, hell hates you. Hell, the Bible's over and over and over it teaches this, and people say, oh, I don't believe that anymore. That's okay, you don't have to believe it, but hell hates you. So you need to figure that out. Hell hates you. So, 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 if God says, listen, I, I just withdraw from people who hate me. That's a, and then what happens? You get an inheritance that you didn't really think you were asking for. It's dark. It's visited from the third and fourth generation because God is no longer protecting you, guarding you, or holding back darkness from you. So, so, so what does that mean? It means this, have you ever realized that you inherited something from your great, great, great grandparents? Hello? Some of you have addictive personalities. You think you're the first one in your family with one? You're probably not. Did you ever notice that you inherited your looks from somebody in your family? You're very quiet. You're like, <laughs> How about your race? Did you figure out you inherited your race from somebody in your family? That was pretty easy. But, 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 but hold it. We inherit all kinds of things, emotions from people, and you also receive a spiritual inheritance from people in your lineage. And that's what he's talking about here. So God is really saying, listen, if you love me, if you seek my face, you don't ever have to worry about any kind of guiltiness being passed on anybody, anywhere. That's not gonna happen. And, and so in my life, when I started trying to get free from bondage, friends, I actually went back, and Gail and I went on vacation, we went back and just looked at family members, people that I didn't know, people I didn't understand, what was my lineage like, and, and I actually went to a place where when I realized, wow, my great-great-grandfather was a drunk, and this person was a drunk, and that person was a drunk, I was like, man, we have a problem in my family. We have an addictive personality. Do you understand what I'm saying? And can you do anything about that? Absolutely. You bring the blood of Jesus to that. You go and you just say, Father, I don't want this to be passed on to my kids or their kids or my grandkids. Or I just, in the name of Jesus, I want you to sever that now and end that because your cross bought my freedom and you bought my family's freedom. And as long as I honor you, I can be sure of this, you will honor me back. Friends, some of you need to do that. You really need to look at your family and go back and do some house cleaning and say some things that need to be severed, anger, bitterness, jealousy, whatever it looks like in your family. You can go after those things because God is crazy about you. Now, we're not even through the first page of notes. So we better hurry, right? So, so let's keep going. You got the idea, but here's the problem. We often misunderstand God. I mean, we do. We, we think that God, if my life is hard, God cannot be good. Well, let me help you with something. God is not in this for your comfort. I know that might astound some of you. You might be sitting there going, are you kidding? If God loves me, he should make me really nice and comfortable. No, 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 God is in this for your character, not your comfort. He wants your character to grow. That's the thing you're gonna take into eternity with you is your character. So God is always trying to shape our character. And David understood this when he fell. In Psalm 51, one and two, he said this, God, in your goodness, in your, what? Goodness, in your goodness, have mercy on me, wash away all my guilt, make me clean again and from my sin and cleanse me. See, David understood this, that what, what he was asking for wasn't based on him being a good guy, because he wasn't, him doing the right thing because he didn't. What he was asking for was based on God's character. God is good all the time. And David knew that, so he went after God and he said, based on your goodness, would you have mercy on me? How many know some of you need to learn to pray like that? 
You need to learn to run to your father and go, God, not based on me being good, not based on me being nice, not based on me being smart, just based on how great you are. Would you please heal me? Would you please forgive me? Would you please wash me? Would you please restore me? Because see, God is in that business, friends. Psalm 27, this is one of my favorite verses. Not the first part, verses 10 and 11 and 12, but verse 13. It says this, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my foes. People are coming against him. Do not deliver me over to the desire of those who are against me, my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such a breathed out violence. I love this verse though, verse 13. For I would have despaired unless I would have believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now that is an incredible statement. The reason I love that verse so much is because it was handed to me very prophetically by a person who said, I was praying for you and the Lord just showed me you're in the darkest time of your life and I was. I was in this super depressed, low place. My marriage was messed up really bad. My life was messed up really bad. And he said, listen, I, I just wanna speak this over you that your despair is gonna be broken because you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the what? Of the living, of the living. And literally, you gotta get that because some of you need this. You need to figure this out. God, yes, God is gonna come in eternity and it's all gonna be good. He'll wipe away every tear from your eye. The Bible's very clear about that. But, 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 but hold it, there's a promise here in Psalm 27, 13. And what is the promise? That you, won't, you don't have to despair this side of heaven that God will come and, with goodness in the land of the living. While you're here on the planet, friends, that God will show up, that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You need to grab those kind of things and those promises of God and jump on them. So how many of you know we need the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? I, I, I mean, I do. Some of you are like, yeah, okay. Well, I hope you're a little more excited about it than that, but Hebrews 4.15 says this about the goodness of the Lord. It says, we don't have a high priest who can't get our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in everything just like we are, but has never fallen, has never sinned. Now, verse 16 makes a really important statement. It says, therefore, how many know if there's a therefore, that it's there for a reason? So it's always, a, so it's talking about, we have a high priest, Jesus, who gets our stuff. Now, some of you don't get this. You think, oh, God doesn't like me because I'm so messed up. My thinking is so wicked sometimes. I have these bad thoughts. And listen, God gets that. He loves humans in spite of us being human. Therefore, because he's such a great God, therefore, let us draw near with confidence. Literally, run to God, run to God, run to God. How? With confidence. Not like this, like, oh, I know you hate me, God. I know you don't want to talk to me today. I know, Lord, I messed up again. Oh, man, you must be so mad at me. The Lord, the Lord God is compassionate, gracious, slow, 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 slow to anger. Is that right? You got to know the Bible. You got to get this in your head. God is slow to anger. Your mama was fast to anger. But God is slow to anger, and God is not your mama. You got to, do you know how much we confuse these things? You gotta get this right. God is slow to anger. Come to God with confidence. Yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor, I messed this thing up. I don't need to understand, God understands. And he's crazy about you. Come with confidence, therefore let us draw near with confidence to what? The throne of judgment. No, it doesn't say that. It says the throne of grace. His throne is a throne of grace. He literally says this, and I'll take care of you. I got it. I got your front, your back, your side, your middle, your top, your bottom. I got it. So that you can receive mercy and grace to help in a time of need. Anybody need that? Man, come with confidence. Don't come ashamed. Come boldly. Father, I know you love me. I know I messed this up. Please heal me. Please forgive me. Please restore me. Please renew me. And do it because you're such a good, good father. You are. You're a good father. You're such a good, good father. So, so, so how do I know that? Well, it starts at the cross, friends. I mean, that's the declaration of eternity is the cross, is the goodness of God. The cross is a highway to heaven. 
The cross marks out your Father's heart and says, listen, walk here and you can walk right into my heart. If you want to know me, just get on the cross and walk across the cross because I bridge the gap between us with the cross and you can experience my goodness because of the cross. See, God put, his, put our goodness above his own, his own well-being. That's really what the cross says. When somebody puts your needs above their needs, what does that say to you? That they care about you, doesn't it? When you put your children's needs above your own needs, what are you saying? Aren't you saying, I I'm willing to sacrifice you because I what? I care for you. I care for you. And I understand that my care for you is going to cost me something. There's a sacrifice. That's exactly what God has said at the cross. God is trying to say to you, listen, listen, get this. This is the only story in the world where the king dies for the peasants. Somebody should make a movie about that. No, really, I mean, come on. When does the king die for the peasants? In the Bible. Jesus is the king, we are the peasants. And he said, I'm happy to die for you. It's the only story anywhere in the world where this happens. Jesus said it the last night he was on the planet, John 15, 13, he said, the greatest love you can have is to give your life for somebody else. And he was getting ready to do that. Why? Because he was trying to declare to you the Father's goodness towards you. That God is a great God. He loves you. Every time you look at a cross, you should think that. That cross is a demonstration of a highway into your Father's heart. That God actually made a roadway into heaven from earth and said, please walk this road into my heart, into my heart. If you travel this road enough, you're gonna find my heart for you. I have opened up my heart for you. That's what the declaration was when the veil was torn in the inner holy of holies. You remember that? Come on, somebody say yes. That the veil was torn in the holy of holies and people were like, what happened? God made a declaration. My heart is open to you. I, my son has died to open my heart to you so you can know my goodness. The cross is your highway to heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 puts it this way. God took the sinlessness of Christ, his perfection, poured into him all of my sin, and then exchanged, poured, poured God's goodness back into me. That's what he did. He, there's an exchange that takes place. My wickedness for his goodness. It's an amazing thought. See, Jesus takes the guilt from every murder, gossip, rape, lie, molestation, racism, evil, tax evasion, lie, you name it, he took it. Everything, everything, everything in history. When God looks at you, he doesn't see sin, if you know Jesus. He sees Jesus. That's what it means that you have the righteousness of God. You have the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. What does that mean? That you are right with God. But I don't feel like that, Pastor. I feel guilty and ugly. Yeah, 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 you need a bath, man. Get to Jesus and let him clean you up. You do, you stinky little thing. But, 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 but listen, God's crazy about you. God's crazy about you. He's crazy about you, he just says, come to me. Come to me, all you are weary, heavy laden, come to me. I laid down my life. I made a roadway into the Father's heart for you. God is good all the time, all the time. God is, he is. Romans 4.25 puts it this way. Jesus died for our sins and he rose again to make us right with God. That's righteous with God, filling us with all of God's goodness. All God's justice, all of God's justification. He, he's just, the word is justification, but it, it literally means just as if you had never done anything wrong. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your mess. He sees Jesus' hope for you. He sees Jesus' life in you, covering your life. Romans 8.32 says it this way. Since God did not, and this is huge for your prayer life. We're gonna, we're gonna get here where this is gigantic for your prayer life. Since God didn't spare even his own son, but gave Christ up for all of us, won't he now also give us everything else that we need? What? Everything else that you need. You, do you have any needs? You do, I know you do, I do, we all do. Here's the, here's the reality. Here was the statement of the cross. The heavy lifting is the cross. I already did that. 
If I did that, I can do everything else for you. That's the declaration of the cross. That's exactly what this says. Won't he also give us everything else we need? Now, now, see, he's just saying this. I solved your biggest problem already. No matter what happens this side of eternity, if you know Jesus, you're in. You're gonna make it. You're gonna be okay. He did the hard work on the cross. Now, there's a problem with this verse, and we've talked about it for several weeks now, but let's cover it one more time before we wrap this series up. The problem is he said everything else we need. You know, that was that theological song that the Rolling Stones wrote a long time ago. I thought somebody might figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> you can't always get what you want. Yeah. Here's what Jesus, yeah, I'm not going to give you what you want, but I will give you what you need. Do you understand that? I'll give you what you need. Why? Because I'm a good, good father. I'm a good, good father. I will give you what you need, everything else you need, not everything else you want. We covered this at length last week because, friends, this is about character. It's about relationship. It's about growing your life in your heart. And how many of you know that can be painful? You don't like this part. Now you're like, it was a good message up to here. <laughs> no, 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 come on, let's be real. The, 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 the truth is there's a huge difference between the things that I want and the things that God says I really need. There's a huge difference. We talked about last three weeks about this. You know, uh, the truth is I'm really glad that God hasn't given me some of the things I wanted. How about you? I'm really glad. I look back and I'm like, whoosh, that was a close call, okay. But God's not gonna derail my destiny. And we said that to you last week. God's not gonna derail your destiny, your purpose in life by answering a prayer that you wanna say yes, he's gonna say no. Why, because he's a good, good father. L -l Listen, Jesus told this story He'd spent so much time trying to convince humans that the Father was good. So much time. When he was talking about giving the Holy Spirit to people, he told the story in Luke chapter 11. It says, you fathers, if your children ask you for a fish to eat, and this is like a super exaggerated story, so you gotta get that. Jesus is like jumping way off the cliff to try to get people's attention. So he says, if you father, if you fathers, if you, you fathers, if your children ask you for a fish to eat, you're not going to give them a snake, are you? Hello? The answer's what? Okay, if you're sitting there listening, you're going to say no. Or if they ask you for an egg, you're not going to give them a scorpion, are you? Okay. Of course not, Jesus said. That's so obvious. Of course not. So you, if you are sinful people, the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is that right? That's Romans chapter three, okay, so we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Simple people, we know how, to, and he says, and you know how to give good gifts to your kids, your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is a good, good God, give the Spirit of God to those who ask him? But see, there's a principle underneath this. God will never give you anything that will hurt you. That's what Jesus just said. He's a good, good Father. All, James says, all good gifts come from where? From above. All good gifts come from God. You just name your good gifts that you have in your life, and it came from God. All good gifts, look at you. That's so sweet. She's like, look at you. I saw it right away. She reached over and touched you, man. You should be like, you smiling under that mask? <laughs> I said all good gifts, and she started rubbing his arm, and I was like, he didn't even respond, though. Come on. I'm like, <laughs> hopefully he was smiling. Hopefully he was smiling. So I just had to give it to him. All right, we'll keep going. But, 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 but this is so important because God is a giver of good gifts, is he not? He gives blessings to us. And see, here's where this gets hard because the ultimate test of this is life and death. I mean, it really is. The loss of a loved one, a painful illness, a tragedy. See, in my life, I, I should have died a whole bunch of times. Like before I knew Jesus, I should have died. I remember the night that a guy stuck a 44 Magnum in my face and he was drunk and he should have just blown my brains out and he didn't. That was a blessing that he didn't. But, but there were so many other times I should have died. Dumb things I've done. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've done the same kinds of things. You thought, I shouldn't be alive, you know? If I was a cat, I would have nine lives. That's what I'd be thinking. But, 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 but here's the, the truth. Like the time I speared myself in the face with a piece of rebar. Okay, so, so yeah, I was, I was like trying to get this rock out of a pipe and so I put a piece of rebar in it, took a sledgehammer, took a swing at it and, and I hit the rebar finally about the third time and the rebar didn't move, it just bent 
and then it shot back out of the hole. And it went right underneath my glasses and impaled me in my skull. Okay, right here. Cut the nerves in the left side of my face, knocked me out, I'm bleeding all over the place, and I'm thinking, oh man, this is really bad. I get to the hospital, I get to the hospital, the doctor just looks at me and goes, dude, you should be dead. That should have gone right through your eyeball, right through your skull, and you would not be here. And I thought, wow. You know what people said? God is so good that he spared you. God is so good. Listen, there's gonna be a day when God doesn't spare me and I die. Hello? So let me ask you a question. Did God change his mind? Is God not good if I die? You don't like that. You're like, hmm. Wow. No, 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 because see, this is based on God's goodness, not on me, right? God is merciful. He gives you other chances. He gives you other times. But the truth is, his goodness is not based on the reality of if he spares me through a tragedy or he takes me out. It's not based on that. It's based on who he is. See, and trusting God with every answer, believing God's going to give me the good, good thing. God is after my character, not my comfort. God's going to take care of me. I had somebody contact me this week. We were talking about failure. Failure. Anybody hate failure? I mean, I hate failure. It's like, oh, failure. Nobody likes to fail. But how many of you know that you learn from failure? We were talking about failure. Like, oh, man, I failed at this thing. It was really bad. What should I do? I said, listen, just learn. Learn from your what? From your failures. People are human, we make mistakes, we're going to make mistakes. When you fail, learn from your, learn from your failure, don't surrender to it, don't let it identify you as that's who you are the rest of your life. I mean, it's the same thing with pain. Friends, I've learned very little from success, but I've learned a lot from failure. I've learned very little from just being joyful and happy all the time, but I've learned a lot from pain and sorrow. I have, and, I, and I've said that to you over and over and over. Jesus, Isaiah 53, three, Jesus was a man acquainted with what? Sorrow, sorrow. And you said you wanted to be like him. Hello? Yeah, but I didn't mean that, Pastor Dan. Everything but sorrow. No, no, no. He was acquainted with grief and a man of sorrows. That's what the Bible says. And so, because sorrow can build you, it can bring life to you if you let it. You know, I read this poem to you a few months ago because it's impacted me so much over the, over the years. It was just one of those things that got in me and really impacted me. It says this, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, leaving me none the wiser with all she had to say. I've walked a mile with sorrow and never a word said he, but oh, the things I learned from him Sorrow, please walk with me. And really, that is the journey of life, friends, is that there's gonna be hard, hard, hard times, and that doesn't change that God is a good, good, good God. He's a good God. Isaiah 55, eight, we talked about this last week, we talked about it just about every single week, that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are completely different from yours. My ways are different than your ways. Uh, they are higher, as the heavens are higher than earth, so are my ways higher than your ways of my thoughts than your thoughts. God always wants to take care of you. You gotta think like that. God is always good. He deals with me in dimensions I can't comprehend sometimes. I don't get right away, but I have to trust. God, you are good all the time. All the time, all the time, all the time. So I want you to stand with me right now. If you're over at Upland, let's stand together. And let's talk, just as we close up five weeks on prayer, let's talk about that real quick. Because we've tried to say over and over and over, 40 days of prayer is the most important thing we could do. Most important thing we could do for our life, for our church, for our country, for our county, for our city, the most important thing we could do. So I wanna leave you with a couple of thoughts. Satan is not afraid of your plans. Satan is not afraid of your schemes or your strategies. Satan is not afraid of your programs or our church's programs, but he is scared to death of our prayers. So what we've asked you to do for 40 days is commit to praying, believing that you would make a habit, that you would continue to pray. 
Those of you who've been joining us in the mornings here, we're gonna be here next week in the morning at 5.30. Wanna encourage you, continue to join us. But you gotta think like this, new habits, prayer, intercession, believing that God can turn the world upside down. Man, our nation needs a spiritual awakening. Our church needs a spiritual awakening. Our county, our country, the big church, big C church, we need, a, we need revival, friends. And it starts with praying. I need revival. You need revival. It starts with praying. Now Psalm 119, verse 34 says this, Lord, keep me from paying attention to what's worthless. Too many of us spend too much time on worthless things and not on prayer. Keep me from paying attention to what's worthless. Let me live by your word. I want to obey your principles. What does that mean? It means cable TV, social media. If we spend as much time checking in with God as we do checking our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I think we'd be way better. What do you think? We need to pray. You need to get in a small group. You need to get in the Word. If you're going to grow in your walk with God, you've got to make hard decisions. So I want to ask you to pray this week as we close up this 40 days of prayer. Pray that God will revive our church. Pray that God will revive your heart. Pray that God will revive our country. Pray for God's revival in your small group. Pray for God to revive us. We need revival, amen? So Father, we wanna to come to you right now and just say thank you, God, that you are a good, good God. That sometimes we don't get you, you live in a dimension way past us. But we wanna to declare to you, you are a good, good Father. You bring blessings, life, hope, and peace to us. And I pray for people that are here really struggling, Father, really trying to put it together to understand you are a good, good God. What you do to care for your people is an amazing, amazing thing. I pray for us, Father, that we would run down that highway that you open up at the cross and into the Father's heart, that we would touch your heart deeply and know your goodness as David did it would change us forever, forever, forever. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I love to hear our pastor speak about prayer. It's obvious that he's spent so much time. He's learned about prayer, but not just learned about it from an academic standpoint, but he's done it. He's lived it. And I love that to know that our pastor really is praying for us. He's praying for what he speaks to us. And I think we can really learn so much from his experience. And I know prayer can be difficult for some of us. Um, so one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do, in addition to just kind of Thinking about the message, we have some reflection response points that I want to share with you. And if you want to take a, if you want to save the screen or if you want to take a screenshot with your phone, I want to encourage you to do that so that you can kind of work through this message a little bit more as the week goes on. And the first is this re reflection point. How important is your view of God's character in your prayers? We understand theology is like this, this class that you might take in seminary or something like that. But we all have our theology, our understanding of who God is. And it really helps dictate what, like our idea of God's character dictates what we think about our prayers and how we pray, how we, how we proceed to Him, how we go before Him. And so how important is your view of God's character in your prayers? And the other thing I would say, respond to, the, to this. If you ask the Holy Spirit to help you trust God when you don't receive an answer. We've all prayed lots of prayers where we didn't receive an answer, where we felt like the answer was no, or maybe the answer was wait, or maybe as Pastor Dan was saying, it's, are you kidding me? And so how do, you, how do you deal with that? If we could ask the Holy Spirit this week to help us to trust God, even when we're not receiving an answer. And then finally, in your prayer journal, which I hope all of you have, if not, you can get it online, um, there's a daily prayer of surrender. And I would, I would encourage us this week to practice the daily prayer of surrender from the prayer journal. And just to walk through that this week, to pray through it, and just to surrender ourselves before God. And so as always, you can go to um, wallupdates.com for more information. And today, if you'd like to receive prayer and you're watching live, follow the instructions posted by your online host, or you can always call the church office during the week to receive prayer. So we're looking forward to a last little bit of this uh, 40 days of prayer. I want to encourage you to just be a part of it and uh, look forward to see you guys next week. God bless you.